Hi everyone, welcome to another of our virtual videos to replace our February edition of the ILS NYC event, which we had to postpone, unfortunately, due to the Omicron variant of the pandemic. The conference is now being held on April the 22nd in person in New York, and we hope you can attend. Please do visit the website and you can still book your tickets for that. So we wanted to work with our kind sponsors for the event and showcase their thought leadership through this series of videos to thank them for their support. For this virtual ILS NYC 2022 event video, I'm delighted to welcome Lorenzo Volpi, managing partner in charge of business development and fundraising at specialist investment manager Leadenhall Capital Partners, one of our gold sponsors for the conference. Lorenzo, great to see you. I hope you're well. Hi, Steve. Great to see you too. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you. Thanks for joining me. So, as ever, we're looking at the development of the insurance linked securities market with one eye to the future, as the as is the way with all of Artemis's events. Um, Leadenhall Capital Partners is one of the largest managers of insurance and reinsurance linked securities in the marketplace and offers a diversified range of strategies across cap bonds, collateralized reinsurance and private deals, and also life ILS as well. So always good to get Leadenhall's view on the marketplace. And to begin, Lorenzo, there's been a lot of discussion about investor appetite in the run up to the recent renewal season for, for many reasons. And perhaps you could explain how you've seen investor appetite evolve towards the end of 2021. Uh, sure, Steve. So obviously compared to 2019 and 2020, the investors engagement uh, has increased, but it has yet to reach levels that can be compared to post-Hurricane uh, Harvey, Irma and Maria, which we all remember as the year of great reload. I'm actually very pleased uh, to say that we received interest and allocations across both no life and life alternative credit during Q3 and Q4 last year, despite the challenges that COVID situation also has created. After the losses experienced in 17 and 18 uh, and the, and the uh, creep associated with those events. I think the biggest challenge was really to persuade the disillusioned investors that the long-term benefits of the asset class within the wider portfolio location were still valid. Whereas following the 2021 events, new and existing investors are actually, have actually been more curious about hearing what the lessons learned are and how we position our portfolios to take advantage to take advantage of the opportunities that also the perception of climate change actually could bring to our sector. Ultimately, investors uh, welcome client servicing intimacy and an open and transparent dialogue because obviously the investment long-term benefits should be obvious to everyone and you don't want to surprise them, of course. Mm. Yeah, so an, another year where there's lessons learned, as you said, and, and this time around, it's really going to be important that managers like yourselves can demonstrate um, how, you're, how you're moving forwards from this, I suppose. And that, that certainly seems to be on the inward side on what portfolios you're building for 2022. But I would guess also investors are pretty keen to understand how hedging is, is affected in ILS funds as well. Absolutely. So now that now that the renewals are over um, and we have seen some fairly significant rate movements again, in fact, some of the, some of the best in, in a long time in the catastrophe zone, particularly in places like Europe. Um, what's your view at Leadenhall? Do you feel pricing is getting back to where it needs to be? Well, it's a good question. Now, obviously, as you, as you said, we, we are back to levels that we probably haven't seen since 2008. However, I, I strongly believe there is more to come. I mean, if you see what happened during the first of January renewals, so we obviously noticed a very dislocated uh, retro market, you know, reinsurance companies buying protection, and uh, with uh, uh, shortfalls where actually orders uh, at given price uh, could not be clear and price had to actually be increased. Uh, the aggregate capacity, uh, you know, for basically to provide uh, capacity for coverage that could lose money for multiple events in one year was scarce. Uh, there was a significant demand increase for per occurrence contracts, those contracts that could lose money for one event, which uh, have been placed in a larger scale. And uh, that also meant more retention at the bottom of the portfolios and the need also to buy more tail cover for those uh, reinsurers. 
Whereas for primary reinsurance, uh, we've seen a more disciplined renewal uh, with uh, significant pricing increases uh, in loss affected areas, such as, as you said, Europe uh, and also US Gulf or US wind. Uh, however, looking ahead, uh, I think that the dynamics that we've seen in the retrocession market will, ha will have a lag effect into the primary reinsurance. That's our expectation as we get closer to 1st of June. Florida will be definitely forced to reprice. Uh, and there's been already some strong indication that also Japan premiums might increase now at the 1st of April renewals with less uh, working layers uh, uh, being placed, working layers being the one closer to the money where you expect more frictionality also from small events. Now, the, the question I guess is, will additional capital help to mitigate this? Obviously, we're all out, out there, you know, um, trying to persuade investors that they should come in because now we think it's obviously a very attractive moment. Uh, and we're not even sure whether more capital coming in will uh, help uh, to mitigate this premium increase because also the traditional reinsurance companies have an urgent need to improve their combined ratios. And, and you've seen, I mean, we've read also on your um, you know, press releases about the local Florida insurance companies their combined ratio now is well above 100%. Uh, you know, they're increasing rate from 50 to 80%. They need more capital. So they are obviously under stress. And the big question mark is how long will it take them to become profitable again? I mean, it could mm -hmm. take 12 months, 18 months, two years. Also, Florida citizens, which is the insurance of lost last resort, see a, an uptake on their policies, which is which keep increasing over time. So these are definitely strong signals that support our expectation for bigger premium increases with also a dislocated primary reinsurance market rather than a disciplined one as we uh, get closer to 1st of, Je 1st of June renewal. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. It does seem that risk aversion is, um, is helping to keep sort of the rate baseline a little higher now. Um, and perhaps the cap bond market's been a good sort of area that's shown that as obviously it softened a bit through last year, but it did seem to find a floor where investors were just not willing to go below, um, which is which is quite positive when quite a lot of money flowed into that market last year. It shows quite a lot of discipline. Mm -hmm. um, so this time of year, you're now reconciling sort of your January renewal portfolio and obviously you communicate that through to your investors. And how do you think they're feeling? Are they feeling more confident as we move into 2022 with portfolio returns now looking higher? Yeah, definitely, Steve. I mean, that, that's, uh, that's my impression. I mean, there are uh, many types of in, uh, you know, institutional investors uh, uh, across multiple jurisdictions uh, and non-life uh, investments are providing an extremely attractive opportunity. And the same actually is by for, uh, in our case, for life and alternative credit. Uh, you know, investors that uh, are prepared to look at ILS uh, for the long term will definitely benefit from it. I, I think that most importantly, improved terms and conditions are not always apparent in the risk modeling output, but we are confident that the improvements will burn out uh, in the results of the past. Uh, you know, post recent events, uh, investors have also carried out uh, extensive due diligence uh, on our portfolios to get a very good understanding of how we've positioned them for 2022 and beyond, of course. And they seem favorably impressed. I mean, that's at least my impression. But of course, time will tell. I mean, mm -hmm. we've been saying that for a while. Hopefully, you know, that that will happen. Yeah. No, and that's a really good point about terms and conditions because it's the often overlooked area of the renewal, um, which actually can have as much of a difference on your performance as rate itself. So um, there's been sort of consecutive years of firming up of terms. Um, so that should really bode well for longer term performance of portfolios, I believe. So how do you expect investor demand for ILS will evolve through 2022? Um, I mean, do you think appetite will rise because of higher return potential? And also what, what type of structures and strategies do you expect to prove attractive to investors this year? Yeah, so the, obviously, you know, we have to compare it again, probably to the past, uh, just to put a bit of, you know, to put the asset class into the context and also relative, on a relative value basis, you know, how attractive 
ILSs, given what else is available out there. I mean, until you know, 17 and 18, uh, post those events, uh, we saw a lot of investors coming back into the space or actually coming for the first time into the space. Uh, and they seem to have a preference for higher risk, uh, uh, higher return uh, yielding strategies, you know, ILS strong diversifier. I should add a small percentage of it to my portfolio. So why don't we go for high obtain stuff? Now, obviously post events, uh, now investors say, well, maybe we should look at less risky strategies. And uh, now in reality, at Ledenor, we constantly monitor our capacity across uh, uh, you know, the, our funds, and we have uh, multiple funds that we can offer. And uh, we tend to try to grow our uh, assets uh, in parallel across all different strategies. So we are not uh, pushing one product versus the other. Instead, we are going to different type of investors, which might just have different appetites and say, OK, are you prepared to take more tail risk? Or, you know, what, how does the asset does fit within your portfolio allocation? Ultimately, you know, our flexibility also means that we can tailor a, a different type of strategy dependent on each investor's needs. And so obviously I cannot deny that a quiet, a quiet first quarter uh, and more clarity about COVID as well, when I think about our life and alternative credit business, uh, would really help to get more traction. Uh, but the macro environment, uh, as we all know, is extremely favorable, right? We have interest rates rising, and we know that if there's no interest rate sensitivity, if interest rates go up, we actually benefit from it as an asset class. High inflation, more volatility across other asset classes. So again, you know, the, uh, you know all, all these factors are bringing attention to ILS again as a very attractive proposition. So. I'm bullish by nature and positive by nature, so I hope, I hope it's the case. So far, such good. As a firm, we've done extremely well for a very few years, and we expect to continue like that. Mm. Yeah, and it's it's good. It's positive that again, when macro sort of financial market conditions do become volatile, investors do start to turn towards the 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 different type or differentiated products like ILS that can really bring something to portfolios for them. So um, yeah, I think that I think that will be a trend throughout the year again. So I guess uh, maybe we can ask you to sort of put your put your sort of crystal ball uh, in front of you and look into the future. And um, one of the topics that I know you're passionate about, and I know you've been following strongly at Leadenhall is ESG um, and what that means for the ILS investor community and for managers like yourselves as well. But do, do you think the increasing focus will continue this year? And do you, do you think this is going to start to drive more investor appetite as well? Yeah, I have, I have uh, no doubt, Steve. I mean, ESG is uh, obviously that, that the top of every investor's agenda, you can't deny it. Uh, and uh, we are, as you said, I mean, we, we take it very seriously. For us, it's extremely important. Uh, there's been a lot of demand to report on the ESG impact, uh, and we are constantly engaged in discussions with investors. You know, for example, the a new UK uh, stewardship code uh, of uh, you know, 2020 that, that set high uh, standards for asset owners and as the manager, it's not just basically stated, it's not just about uh, signing up to policies, but continually evidencing how investment firms are actually meeting their ambitions. Now, mm -hmm. at Ledenor, we have a strong, we are strongly committed to actually develop and integrate ESG and sustainability issues into our firm ethos, investment risk management framework, and of course, investment decision making process. Now, I expect that even more interest in reporting on the S aspect of ESG. You know, investors are expected to become more interested in how ILS protects and has helped communities affected by disasters. Of course, I mean ESG is the, you know the S factor is a part of insurance. On governance, there will be increasing interest on how we assess the best government insurers and engage with others to encourage better governance. And given the recent moves in the ILS market to the combination of attractive pricing, as well as alignment with the uh, ESG ambitions, I, I mean, I think that that means uh, there could be a significant increase uh, 
an interest in ILS this year. Maybe one step further that, uh, and that's where we're doing a lot of work, but there is no obvious answer to that because we have such a niche of an asset class with first equity, fixed income and other asset classes, is whether we'll uh, reach a way to actually uh, get a rating uh, as well uh, that uh, will immediately recognize the benefits of the uh, insurance linked investment within portfolios that have, have been specifically designed you know, for the for ESG uh, allocations. Mm. Yeah, no, that, that could be really interesting and very attractive to the big ESG allocating investors out there as well. Um, so, yes, yeah, certainly another trend to watch out for over the coming year. Uh, well, look, thank you very much, Lorenzo. I really appreciate uh, talking with you today. And thank you to everyone at Leadenhall for the support for the conference. Great to oh, see thank you. you. Thank you, Steve. Um, so to everyone watching, you can still get your tickets for the conference and you'll be able to hear from Lorenzo on the day in New York, um, April the 22nd. Please visit our website and sign up today.